Well, thank you. Um, I'm today. I'm going to kind of take some time and talk about. Uh, really kind of what I'm seeing is some new opportunities for sheep and goat producers. And this this uh, kind of goes to the growing population of our backyard producers in a lot of ways, I think. So I'll talk about some of these new opportunities and some of the research uh, that we've been doing at USU to, to kind of answer some questions on management based around um, how we're doing targeted grazing with sheep and goats. Um, if you do have any questions regarding sheep or goat husbandry, I'd love to answer those questions too. Feel free to write them down in the Q&A. Um, and if I don't get them to, to them during this presentation, I will definitely uh, get to them afterwards if you contact me. So <clears throat> first, before we get going, talk about targeted grazing, I just wanted to speak real quick on what is targeted grazing. Um, so targeted grazing is the application of a specific kind of livestock at a determined season, duration, intensity to accomplish really a defined vegetation or landscape goal. So, so usually when we're talking targeted grazing, we're usually doing it at the benefit of our land. Now, those of us who have raised some livestock understand that in order to be good cattle producers or good sheep or goat producers, we also have to be really good at growing grass or growing some kind of vegetation um, if we don't want to spend all of our money um, on buying hay. And so with that, let's kind of take a look on how well sheep, in my mind, sheep and goats fit this role of targeted grazing so well. And so in this case, we're, we're matching our objective of the landscape with our objective of the livestock or our animals. And really we wanna profit off of both of them. So we find a middle ground, but I think it's important to say that really we can't maximize forage growth and maximize all of our animal potential at the same time. Usually you have to kind of find a middle ground. But one of the reasons that sheep and goats do so well at this is if we kind of look at the grazing preference of our, our three main ruminant animals, and we could probably put new world camelids like alpacas and um, llamas in this category too. But we can see that cattle, the, the real story with cattle is they just, they love grass. But as you look at preferences for sheep and goats that you, you see they're, they're a little bit more prone to want to eat on forbs or kind of weedy broadleaf type plants and goats are really good at browsing on things or getting high up on trees. I think if any of you have ever tried to take a couple of your goats into a small orchard that you have, you may see the, the benefit of having goats graze up trees, but also the destructive nature uh, that goats have in that they clear things all the way up. Now this, this has been super beneficial and here's a couple success stories of this. So one, being leafy spurge across the west. So we're looking at invasive weedy plants. Um, so maybe around Cache Valley would be dyer's woad, um, mustards, uh, leafy spurge that sheep do really well on, but cattle just don't really eat very well. Another really good example as we go more to kind of a browse species of plants is kudzu in the south. And so you see a lot of operations taking advantage of maybe smaller groups of animals, um, kind of our backyard flocks, and going into these areas with a lot of overgrowth and maximizing on the growth of their animal and reducing the vegetation. So we're meeting that landscape or vegetation goal, right? And so this has been very successful. And I think it's also looked at as very environmentally clean when compared to utilizing herbicides, right? And so you see a lot of places that are willing to put in that extra effort in utilizing a more green alternative of using animals um, to reduce weeds or weed control instead of using chemicals. And so one example of this would be solar grazing. Currently, when I talk to different specialists across the US, um, in the Midwest and in the South and the East Coast, opportunities grazing solar farms is just exploding right now. 
a lot of people are having a hard time even finding the number of sheep in order to do this. And so these um, kind of green alternatives to energy, being solar power, are looking for also a green alternative to reducing vegetation underneath these uh, solar panels. And so what they'll do is they'll come in, they'll do targeted grazing. And in this case, they're using an electric uh, fence in order to slowly move the animals up to get uniform grazing across this area. And sheep do really well in this because they're less likely to climb on things or uh, bang up panels, things like that. And they're small enough to get up under these solar panels. And so they do really good at this job. Uh, you may have even seen some urban areas that utilize goats, right? And so in places that have a lot of invasive weeds and things like that, goats do a really good job going in and just cleaning it out. And so we're starting to see more and more operations that maybe start as backyard operations, but then find a neighbor who needs some weed control or maybe a nearby municipality and then pretty soon they're operating based on moving their animals from location to location, utilizing things like electric fencing. Now, if you have the space, you could also do this on your operation, right? And so I think it opens up a lot of opportunities where these animals are best suited in comparison to, to other types of animals. Now, there's a individual uh, by the name of Alan Savory that has done a lot of work uh, talking about kind of short duration, high intensity grazing. And so I kind of wanted to speak on that because that's kind of the new thing that everyone wants to do um, as far as taking a lot of animals, confining them in a small area for a short amount of time, um, essentially leveling out all the vegetation and then moving to a new location. And in some areas, there has been some benefits. Um, in some areas, uh, not quite as many benefits. And it really depends on how the biology of that plant works. Sod forming grasses do great because they can bounce back uh, to heavy grazing pretty well. But maybe some of our more native plants here in the West, they're not used to that kind of uh, grazing event. So they may have a harder time uh, bouncing back from that. But essentially what we're doing, like we saw with the pictures of these goats and sheep, is we're localizing these animals in a really confined environment. So our stock density of animals is super high. And with that, um, we're able to leave them in in a very short duration of time. And because this is being looked at as such a sustainable way of grazing and things like that, um, we started to do a project that I wanna speak to uh, for just a little bit on a project we did with the Department of Natural Resources this summer. And so I had some really great undergraduate students who uh, did this project with me and we took um, 40 or we took, how many was it? Is it 40 animals? Um, a, a, num a number of sheep and goats um, both together to graze down some invasive plants on some wildlife habitat. And so um, with that, we found out some things that I thought were kind of interesting that I think can still relate to many of our backyard producers as they're trying to learn how to move fencing to utilize short duration, high density grazing um, and what impacts that could have on your operation. So the objective of this project um, when I was approached about it was essentially to increase the quality of the habitat in this wildlife area um, by increasing uh, winter vegetation for a mule deer. Um, but in doing so, we had to get rid of a lot of the invasive weed species that were currently present in the area. And so this happened in Richmond, Utah, um, not far from uh, Cherry Creek um, Ski Resort, if anyone has been there. Um, so the main species of weed we are dealing with is field bindweed. Um, if you're not familiar with this, uh, you may have seen this growing in your garden, right? So I know that my backyard is full of this stuff and every year I'm struggling to pull it out of my garden or pull it out of my flower beds. Um, and I know my neighbors struggle with the same thing. So this may seem familiar to you uh, with that. Now this is a 
really awful plants to try to get um, on top of. Um, after looking up more of the biology on this plant, these roots go down about 10 feet. Um, and even if you were to remove the roots from, you know, almost three to four feet down, they can still come back. Um, or those seeds actually persist in the soil up to about 50 years. And so this, this is a very invasive species that does really well in really disturbed areas. And so our goal was to see how intensive grazing could essentially help remove this invasive weed and hopefully help the habitat for mule deer. So we took 40 sheep, and these were a polypay rambolay uh, type sheep. So polypays are found um, throughout the West, um, but largely in the Midwest, pretty prolific sheep, breed out of season, offer a medium quality wool, and rambolays is um, really the base of most of the big range operations uh, that you see up in the mountains while you're hiking or camping. And so we use the cross of those animals. And then for our goats, we used uh, Spanish and boar crosses. And so you can see here, they kind of have that colored markings of the boar goat, um, but with the black heads uh, with that cross of Spanish goats. And so what we did is we localized them in small allotments and we rotated every about three to four days to the next allotment. And what we're gonna do, and we're gonna take pictures this coming spring to see how well we did last year, is we're comparing how well a combination of grazing, intensive grazing with herbicide works against grazing alone and herbicide alone. So could these maybe more green alternatives using animals offer some uh, management that is equal um, or maybe better or, or maybe worse than utilizing just chemicals on plants. Um, in some ways, uh, we weren't exactly sure what we thought we were gonna see, um, but one thing that was really interesting to us is I had some students out there and every morning they were counting what type of plants the sheep and goats ate. And when it came to filled bindweeds, some of these areas were just completely filled bindweed, this plant that's kind of in that morning glory family. And we saw that these sheep actually did a much better job at eating this filled bindweed than the goats did. Um, I thought for sure the goats would go in and just target this stuff even better than the sheep. But based on what we counted and what we looked at, uh, the sheep actually did a better job, which was pretty surprising to me. To kind of give you an idea on how well they did at this, uh, this is one area, little, um, little less than kind of an acre type area. And we um, put them out there and this was day one to day three. Now, when they pull up one plant to fill bindweed, it really opens up like a large square of land. And that's why you can see so much more bare ground here. Um, but uh, they did a great job. And so they cleaned this up uh, really well. We kind of forced them down to, to eat as much as they wanted. And by the end of those three days that they were localized in this area, they're ready to go to the next area. You can see a couple rose bushes in the background of these pictures. And uh, the goats got on these pretty well. There was a lot of mustard plants through here. Uh, the mustard plants were one of the last things that they wanted to eat. Um, but nonetheless, it shows how well uh, these small ruminants can really go in and take care of those vegetation goals, whether it's your backyard or a, or a weedy pasture you have, or maybe a neighbor um, that you can, maybe your neighbor can rent your goats or rent your sheep for a small period of time, or maybe you even get a job with uh, your local uh, municipality. Now, one question I really wanted to answer as the sheep specialist here is I really wanted to know, okay, if, if our Department of Natural Resources or another agency wanted to hire sheep and goat producers to come and do this for them, uh, a small flock, a big flock, what impacts does it have? And so this study really only took place over the course of a month. So pretty, pretty short time frame. And usually when you're dealing with invasive weeds, or plants, it really, you're trying to hit them at a very specific time when oftentimes they'll flower up or grow right before 
uh, the plants you really want on your operation. So and normal grasses and things like that. And so sometimes you may have a sheep flock that you lamb prior um, to your other animals, just so that you can get them out on that pasture to graze those invasive plants. But what we did see is that the animals across the whole study, even though we accomplished this goal, our vegetation goal, remember targeted grazing definition, even though we, we accomplished this goal of reducing a ton of that field bindweed, uh, we, saw, we saw some pounds lost on our animals. They lost a little bit of weight. Um, with our goat or with our sheep on average, it wasn't very much, right? So we only lost about three pounds on average over the course of the month. Um, with our goats, uh, we lost about eight pounds. So percentage-wise, this is a pretty large percent. And a lot of management decisions we make in the sheep and goat industry are really based on uh, the amount of uh, body condition our animals have. You know, whether they're ready to breed based on how much fat storage they have or going into lactation, do they have enough body storage to lactate for their lambs and kids? And so I just wanted to remind you that about 12 to 14 percent of a mature body weight is equivalent to one body condition score. So if we had animals going out that are losing a, almost 10 percent of their body weight, um, we're losing, you know, a half to maybe a full body condition score. Um, this may not be optimal in, in how we're trying to make money, um, unless we're getting paid pretty well by accomplishing our vegetation goals. Uh, there are also other challenges. So uh, this, is a, this is a pretty big challenge when it comes to goats, right? And so uh, here, this goat got tangled up, ripped down the fence, and this was the only time it happened. So our animals did really well and we consistently had students out here with them and so we caught this uh, super fast but let all the animals out and then they go and graze somewhere else and it's hard to accomplish our vegetation goals with with issues like this but this is just the nature of of owning goats um, and also the reason that they do graze really well um, on a lot of those uh, larger growth and things like that so Ultimately, if we did decide, okay, I have an opportunity to do some targeted grazing work for someone, um, what do I need from my animal to make money in that situation? And so the type of animals that make us money are the ones that grow really well, right? We are mothers that produce good milk, so our does and our ewes that produce good milk and good lambs, uh, vigorous animals, very hardy animals that live despite maybe harsh uh, climate situations or things like that. And we want animals that fit in our production system. So if our production system is to graze solar farms or to graze um, along the roadside in our neighborhood, um, or maybe in our neighbor's backyard, we need animals that do well in those situations. Um, but what impacts could it have on this kind of intensive grazing where we're forcing the animal to eat a specific thing instead of giving it free choice of all the food it wants um, and trying to force them to eat this. Uh, this, could, this could have some issues, right? And so we really need to think about a couple of things. What time of year are we doing this and what animals do we have available? Do we have a bunch of open ewes that we can afford to put on this or does that aren't raising kids, they could afford to maybe do this. But if you're using lactating does, they may lose a lot of body condition while they're trying to lactate and accomplish these vegetation goals. And so that could be uh, really difficult. The other thing is oftentimes we try to match our forage production with our grocery bills. I like to say grocery bills, but the nutrient demands of our animals. Um, these cool season grasses and warm season grasses, our invasive plants are usually a little bit before that. And so depending on what we're trying to do, we may need to kid or lamb a little bit sooner to try to match that vegetation goal instead of what we normally do from year to year. And so I really just kind of want people to think about how utilizing this kind of management, whether they're just in their own operation, 
rotating from one area to the next, um, how are your animals doing in it? You know, do you do you need animals that are parasite resistant? Do you need uh, animals that uh, do well in that scenario? Um, so while targeting grazing can increase those forage and landscape goals, like we talked about, whether it's a small pasture or a large rangeland, it helps with that sustainability. Um, but what, what production impacts are we having? And there's all these new opportunities open for sheep and goat producers across the West. And so what, how, how is this gonna impact your production? Uh, try to see the whole picture. And so we should be thinking about where our animals are in the stage of production. Are they lactating? Are they trying to carry a lamb or kid? Um, what are their nutritional demands? What nutrition do those plants have? In the case of the filled bindweed, it was actually pretty high uh, in crude protein, surprisingly, and pretty good feed stuff. The only problem is, is once it flowered and matured, the sheep and goats didn't want to eat it as much. Um, and then lastly, what are the objectives of the operation? I know many people who aren't as worried about the sale of lambs because they're um, given enough money to do this targeted grazing that it's not as important to them. But if your operation is mainly dependent on the sale of lambs and the growth of your uh, the growth of your animals, then this is something you should think about. So I I hope that was informative and maybe gets people thinking what opportunities are available near me that I can take advantage of with this targeted grazing, um, high density, short duration type grazing. And so with that, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Page. We've got two questions that have come in on the Q&A. Uh, one is, are either sheep or goats affected with white top control? Um, I guess I would need to explain what is white top control, Josh. You want to help me out with that one? Yeah, so white top is a common invasive weed, and they're asking if either one of them would be um, effective in the control of it. And I will tell you uh, from personal experience, the answer is yes, both of them. Okay. I've actually used my use. Uh, we we help the local um, sewer ponds where they do a lot of the sewer pond waste treatment stuff. There's some mm -hmm. white top out there, and we've actually had some success in using sheep and goats both to control it. We have a neighbor that sends our goats out. Sometimes uh, we kind of alternate the use of that area. So, yeah, I that's one I have not heard of is white top. I, I'm there's so many plants out there that it's it's hard for me to know them all. But um, that's good that you do have some ex experience. Josh is a a source of a lot of good information. Then the last question is uh, concerning weed control and small ruminants. Uh, Evan asks, uh, he has heard questions, uh, heard variable numbers in regards to weed seed viability reduction after passing through the animal's digestive system. Do you know reliable numbers for this? Um, in regards to this, I, I've also heard variable aspects of this. And I think the true answer lies somewhere in when the seeds go through the digestive system, um, if if any are viable afterwards, it's a very small percentage. Uh, however, I think when it comes to sheep or goats, carrying seed heads in the form of on their wool or on their legs or in their hooves is probably a much greater issue. And so whether it be feces or or in their wool or something like that, it's usually common practice for some of these producers to dry lot their sheep for a number of days, uh, so that whole digestive tract gets cleaned out on while they're eating a hay or something on your operation before you move them to a new location. And this would help try to deter any further spread of an invasive weed or something like that. Um, and so. I would just make sure that, you know, a lot of burrs and things like that aren't transferring from one location to another. Now, if you're dealing with one type of plant that's just across every location, maybe that's not as big an issue to you. But uh, that is something I would love to study myself is how viable those seeds are passing through the digestive tract. Great question. Okay, we have just about one more minute. If there's anybody else that would like to type a question into the Q&A, 
We appreciate so much Dr. Page uh, joining us for his insight and for his uh, knowledge in these areas. He's a great resource. And again, we, uh, as he's encouraged you to do, if there's any further questions or concerns that you might have throughout uh, throughout your small ruminant production, uh, if you reach out to him via email, he's a great uh, source of knowledge for those things. Thanks so much for your time, Dr. Page. Thank you very much, Josh. I'll, I'll see you later and feel free to reach out with anything if anyone has a question after.